I'm going to conclude this influencer series. And in this series, we've been talking about the influence of the early church and how that influence, uh, there's like this ripple effect of influence that spread all, all over the Roman Empire and all over the world and even affects us now. And today I'm going to be talking about the influence of the Holy Spirit and the arrival of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And this happens in Acts chapter 2. And so I'm going to look at Acts chapter 2. That's our chapter for today. Now, I read this over and over again. Someone said, preach it. Preach it, Greg. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to preach from Acts chapter 2. Um, as I read through this, these uh, two aspects of the story were highlighted to me. They stood out. They popped up off the page, these two layers of the story. One was these people of the early church had a spiritual experience. They had a God encounter there's a supernatural display, this life-changing event, the Holy Spirit. That's one aspect. And you see that all throughout the book of Acts. And also in this chapter, you see this very practical layer, this practical aspect, and that is a family. The church is beginning to look and act like a family. They're taking care of one another. They're eating together, praying together. They're selling their own stuff so that they can take care of the needs of the other people in the church. And so these two layers, I want to go back and forth. And uh, there's going to be an interplay between the two layers, the, the Holy Spirit, spiritual experience on one end, and then the practical family, the church as a family. And I'm going to start off by talking about my story. I am a bit about my story uh, growing up in the church family. Uh, see, I grew up um, in a single mom home. It was uh, just me, my mom, and my sister, and we didn't have a lot of money. We, we struggled for a lot of years. We lived in this kind of sketchy mobile home park. There was like heroin junkies that lived on different, several places on the street. Um, you know, but the, the church was there the whole time. The whole time there was people in the church that provided for us, that took care of us in the different ways that they could. And uh, we went to this big mega church. Uh, this church was uh, at that time about six to 8,000 people all kinds of programs, events, ministries, worship teams at all the different ages. There was volleyball on Monday nights, Awanas, beach trips, all kinds of stuff going on. And it's easy to get lost in a church that big with all that going on. It's easy to, to be unnoticed. And somehow, throughout that whole time, there were people that took care of us, that provided. You know, we got... Uh, we would get care baskets, um, care packages. We would get hand-me-down clothes, which was just fine with us. We would, uh, food baskets. We would, uh, there would be families that would take us in for a season or for years and just make sure we were taken care of for Christmas. And we ate with them and did life with them and prayed with them and went to church with them. There was even a family, um, see, I was in Awanas. Were you guys, anyone in Awanas? Let me know in the chat. <laughs> Awana is uh, this church group, and we would run around in this circular track on the in inside of the church. And I was running around, and this, church, this family noticed that my shoes were destroyed. They were all beaten up. You could see the, the socks coming through the soles of my shoes. And so this family took me to the mall. They picked me up, took me to the mall. And we didn't go to the Payless clearance aisle. We went to the expensive sporting store, the, the expensive sports store you know, with the jerseys that are $85 for some reason. Uh, they took me there and they bought me these high-end athletic shoes with uh, futuristic gripping technology in the bottom. And they bought me these and they just dropped me off at home. And that was church and that was church family. And growing up, that aspect of the Acts 2 church was very pronounced and visible and clear. I saw that easily and clearly. That's what I knew, church family. Uh, you know, another example, if something broke in our mobile home, sometimes a, a custodian from the church or a handyman would come in with his tools and fix it, repair it. This is what I knew. But at that church, I didn't really see that other aspect, that, that Holy Spirit aspect, the spiritual experience. I, I didn't see much of that aspect. Uh, people didn't bring it up in, in normal conversation. I don't remember it being preached about much. Um, they didn't speak in tongues. Uh, it was not a charismatic church. And it's not what I considered back then to be a spirit-filled church. 
And I even heard people say that about that church, that it was a great church, great music, great worship, great sermons, but maybe not spirit-filled. And so I want that to stand out. What does it mean to be a spirit-filled church? And why did I think that wasn't a spirit-filled church? And for so long in my journey, um, the Holy Spirit wasn't a reality for me. The Holy Spirit was more like this abstract, blurry concept, right? The Holy Spirit was this ancient biblical force that hovered over the waters in the creation tell. Um, the Holy Spirit was this nebulous and blurry, um, maybe as a metaphor for the divine consciousness of God, or maybe it was a scary and weird thing that uh, charismatic churches conjured up. I don't know what I thought, but it wasn't a reality for me. And so much of my journey was longing, was searching, was curious, was wanting to see more beyond just the programs of church and the ministries that, you know, asking those questions, is there more? Is this, is church just a bunch of busy uh, programs that keep us busy? Is it just a bunch of religious activity? Is there more beyond that? Is there that other aspect of the Acts 2 church? that Holy Spirit, that spiritual experience. And the best way to explain this is with this analogy, I'm hoping that Fraser will put this on the screen. Um, best way to ex explain this is with this uh, magic eye picture. This is uh, called the stereogram. And uh, these popped up in the, the um, there it is, in the early to mid 90s, I believe. And they, they popped up all over in malls and people had books of these. Do you guys remember these magic eye pictures? Uh, what they are is uh, what looks like a two-dimensional picture of geometric shapes, colors, and patterns. And that's easy to see. You see that first layer. But some people would claim that they could see a three-dimensional image pop out, that if you looked at it just right, if you crossed your eyes, if you, uh, if you held the picture up to your face and pulled it back, maybe you would see a three-dimensional lion or a dolphin you guys remember this? And they, they had this experience that something popped out of this picture. And I wonder, as you're watching at home, do, does anything pop out? You know, and they had this experience, and they wanted to share this experience with me. They wanted to tell me how they did it, but it, it didn't always register. And it's like I had to search and find it on my own. And I relate to this, this to the church and to the Holy Spirit, in that with the church, we have this first layer that is very easy to see. Um, that is the ministries, that's the programs, that's the men, men's breakfast, that's people on stage playing guitar chords and singing. It's really easy to see that first layer. And that can be beautiful as well. But then there's that question, is there more? Is there more behind, beyond us uh, just being busy with programs and music? And um, is there more? Is there the Holy Spirit? Is there something else? Is there something else that would pop out? And my journey was... Uh, seeing glimpses as time went on, seeing glimpses of that three-dimensional image, and then even having moments where I saw a very pronounced and clear image of the Holy Spirit. And I'll share one of those before moving on to the, to the Pentecost story. So I've been leading worship for, for a long time, and, uh, and for a long time I didn't talk it's kind of a funny thing to say. You know, leading worship, you can, you can start the song and then you end the song, you, you end the set, and you can go for a long time without actually talking, without speaking, without ministering to the church in a way that, that reveals depth of layers and understanding of why we worship. For a long time, I just didn't talk. I don't know if it was fear. It might have been. It might have been that I feel like I didn't have anything to say. It didn't feel like anything was within me. But later on, I went through this season where I grew tremendously in the short period of time in that aspect, in leading the church and ministering to the church in that way. Uh, and it was all with this full dependency on the Holy Spirit, with this sensitivity and this prompting, this guidance to step up, to rise up and speak. And this full dependency to say, God, Holy Spirit, give me the words to say, even now, Holy Spirit, give me the words to say, knowing that I would be carried through it. And uh, I had this experience um, in a worship set 
worship service. We're in the middle of a set in between songs. And I could tell, I could just tell that I'm supposed to talk. And by the way, this, the service, something else was going on in this service. There was a presence in the room and I could tell I was supposed to speak and bring depth of layers to the worship. And so I did, I stepped up, I rose up with that sensitivity to the guidance, with that uh, boldness, with that courage, whatever it is. And it was like I was being used as an instrument that something else was working through me and I spoke and it was just coming out. And right afterwards, the, the worship team continues. They go into the next song. My co-leader starts singing the next song and immediately I'm out. I'm out of it. My eyes are closed. I'm not aware of anything else. Um, there's a sense there's a sense of timelessness, uh, of deep joy, deep peace. I was aware of nothing else but the Lord in this moment. And the worship team is continuing. I'm not helping out. I'm just gone, not aware of my surroundings. And this is really weird. Uh, but, you know, as I'm in this moment, I feel this sensation of radiating heat, of warmth, of heat just kind of going from the outside, from, sorry, from the inside out, feeling like nothing else. And at the same time, like a fresh wind from the outside in. I know that's weird. <laughs> it's a weird thing to talk about. Wind and heat. Um, you know, and with the spiritual experience, with moments like that, it's like our vocabulary uh, ventures into uncharted realms right? It's, it's beyond our normal experience. And we try to describe it. We try to poetically describe it or articulate it, but we can't quite articulate the fullness of it. And so the best we can do is use symbols and use analogies like that magic eye analogy and sometimes use art to somehow explain some aspect of it. And so uh, when I came to the band is in the middle of the song and I, I kind of become aware of my surroundings. I look down, I was wearing this, this Heather Gray shirt. I look down, there's this like tears on this shirt. My face is wet. And it only, what I can only describe, not as sad or happy tears, but holy tears. And I don't know what to make of this experience. Uh, you could say that I was having an emotional experience that went with music, uh, but there was something else going on on that day. There was a, uh, a person who was speaking for the first time that day, giving a sermon for the first time. And he gave a sermon that cut to the heart of the people. And he said, at the very end of the service, he said, if you need prayer during this last song, come up to the front of the room and let the rest of the church pray, pray for you and pray with you. So we start the last song and over a third of the church came up to the front of the room, people on their knees, people crying, people needing prayer. And about another third of the church came in behind them and put their hands on them and prayed. You know, what a holy moment. What a divine moment. What a spirit filled moment. You know, altogether in that story, there is some kind of experience, but there's also family. There's family praying for, for each other praying with each other, being the church. You know, when you have those moments, when you see and experience those moments, it's like you never will go back to seeing church activity in the same way. It's like something within you rises up and awakens you to divine purpose of this is what we're supposed to do. And that's what happened in the Pentecost story as I transition smoothly into the Pentecost story, Acts chapter 2. Let's go to it. Carrie said, amen. Pentecost happened, um, this event happened almost 2,000 years ago. It was in, took place in Jerusalem. And uh, at this time, Pentecost was already part of an ancient Israelite harvest festival. And so during this time, uh, Jewish men would travel from all over, from all these different nations to Jerusalem to be on um, to be at this harvest festival. So they're in town. Uh, one source I found said that there might have been over a million Jews in Jerusalem on this day for this festival. And at the same time, there is this small group of Jesus followers and they were huddled together in a room, about 120 of them. They were huddled together. They were praying together and they were waiting. What were they waiting for? 
Well, earlier Jesus said, wait here in Jerusalem. You guys are about to receive a gift, receive a power. You're going to be my witness. You're going to start this influence that's going to ripple out throughout the world. But wait here for the Holy Spirit. And so they're waiting and they're praying. And I imagine they're asking questions like, you know, what exactly are we waiting for? And how will we know when it's here? You know, what will it look like? How will it manifest? You know, was that it right there? That guy sneezed. Was that a manifestation of it? I imagine they were wondering. I imagine they were kind of skeptical at times, but they were praying and they were waiting. And then the Holy Spirit arrives on this day as they're in this room. And often we hear about the Holy, we think about the Holy Spirit as this calm and docile, peaceful comforter and helper. And he is, but he also comes like a mighty rushing, roaring, violent wind and like fire, which causes these people to burst out and praise and speak in other languages and make a big spectacle. And that's what happens. Let me go back and read verse two. It says, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Right, a violent blowing wind. Uh, but notice it says a sound like. It's a sound like wind. It's not actual wind. If they were wearing hats in that room, it's not like those hats were blowing off. This is not a weather update. This is uh, either the disciples or the author of Acts saying it was something like the sound of wind. And all throughout scripture, wind was used as a symbol for the Holy Spirit. And even in the gospels, Jesus likened wind to the Holy Spirit. And today it's like the Holy Spirit was breathing in his life into the life of the church. And there's also fire. Verse three says, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Tongues of fire. Uh, notice again, it says what seemed to be fire. It's not like this fire was actually burning their heads. Again, this is, it's, I, I picture this as the disciples or Luke, the author, using symbols, trying to articulate it, trying to use his limited vocabulary to somehow express what this was. It was like wind. It was what seemed to be like fire. Something was happening. And throughout scripture, fire is used as a symbol for the presence of God and for spiritual power. We see this in the burning bush of the Moses story. We see this in the pillar of fire that led God's people through the wilderness and the fire that filled the tabernacle that represented God's presence. And so today it's like that fire is indwelling in each one of these Jesus followers, all 120 of them, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. This is what it says. Verse four, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And this is interesting, um, speaking in tongues, interesting topic. Uh, here in this story, though, this is not a mysterious prayer language. They are actually speaking in other languages they've never spoken in before. Actual langu languages understood by the Jewish foreigners that were in town that day. And what they're, what they're doing is actually declaring God's mighty works and deeds, like praising in these different languages. And people hear it. A crowd forms. It's a spectacle. All these Jewish, um, all these languages and cultures are in that town on that day colliding and they hear what's going on. They hear the mighty deeds of God spoken in their own language and they gather around. Some of them are amazed. Some are perplexed, confused. Some make fun of them. This is what, uh, was it verse 13 says, there were some mockers that said, um, some made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. They must be drunk. They're acting crazy, foolish. They must be drunk. They must be under the influence of alcohol. And so Peter stands up. This, at this point, Peter gives what, what I believe is the first gospel sermon. Peter, this is the same Peter who denied Jesus three times. He struggled um, throughout his uh, time when he, uh, with Jesus, but now he is filled with the Holy Spirit He's filled with a new conviction, a new boldness. He's empowered, a new spiritual authority, a new spiritual backbone. Peter stands up and he gives this message and he says, this was, this was talked about in the scriptures. And he quotes 
the prophet Joel, and Joel talked about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and how there would be visions and signs and dreams and miracles. And then Peter gives this gospel message. He tells them about Jesus, how he was the Messiah, how he was crucified, how he died, how he was buried and rose again, and how this Holy Spirit was this gift that was promised. And Peter says, believe this. He says, repent, be forgiven, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what he offers them. And it says on that, on that day, 3,000 were saved. 3,000 started following Christ, became part of the church. I think I have this scripture on verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And I imagine those Jewish people from all those different nations went back to their respective nations and were an influence in their own nations and maybe even started churches before Peter and Paul got to those areas. But all of this happens in Acts chapter two. All of this, the spiritual experience, the, the wind, the fire, the languages, 3,000 join the church. But then the chapter ends with this, this practical aspect of family, the fellowship of the believers. Let me read this, verse 42. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. They praised God together. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So these people had this spiritual experience, this God encounter. The Holy Spirit arrives. And as a result, they're so moved. They're so transformed. They're so awakened to divine purpose that they just naturally start to live out this life that is a reflection of heaven coming to earth. And that's in the form of taking care of one another. And all throughout the book of Acts, you can see this. They took care of widows. They sent relief to people who were going through famine. They set up a common fund to take care of the needy. They sold possessions to take care of one another. They prayed, worshiped together, ate together. They're a family. So as I think about my early church family, about the people we did life with, about the people we prayed with, we praised with, the people that took us in and took care of us, provided for us, the people who bought me shoes, the hand-me-downs, all that. We didn't talk about the Holy Spirit. We didn't talk in tongues there was no fire, there was no wind, but that church was spirit-filled. That was a spirit-filled church. That is the purpose of Pentecost. That was the beginning of a continual outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is available to all believers from that point. And that church, the people in that church were spirit-filled and they were guided and they were led and they were prompted. And so I, I wanna end this with two questions about our church, about real life. The first one is, is this church a spirit-filled church? Is real life a spirit-filled church? And the answer is yes, of course it is. Yeah, this, I don't know about this building, but the people that make up the church are spirit-filled. We see this goes all the way, that's the point of Pentecost this continual outpouring of the Spirit, working within us, guiding, prompting, directing, teaching. This is a Spirit-filled church. Uh, but the second question is, are we walking in the Spirit? And that's different. Are we walking in the Spirit? Are we being led by the Spirit? Are we accessing it? Are we activating it? Are we being empowered? Are we stepping up and rising up? Are we being led? Are we being guided? Are we partnering with the Holy Spirit in every decision, in every move, from the big decisions all the way down, from the leadership of the church and everybody in every ministry and everybody who goes to the church? You know, are we walking in the Spirit? You know, Charles Stanley says this. He says, to walk in the Spirit 
is to live moment by moment in dependency upon him, sensitive to his voice and obedience to him. You know, are we doing that moment by moment with a heightened awareness of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit interwoven into the fabric of everything that we do from worship team rehearsal to men's breakfast to the one-on-one conversations to the home group? Are we aware, aware of the Holy Spirit, Spirit working and moving even there, giving wisdom, prompting, guiding, giving us words to say? Have you ever been there for a, a friend who was in need, who just needed someone there to talk to? Have you ever been on the phone with somebody who just needed, has ever, anyone ever been on the phone with you when you just needed someone to talk to? Isn't the Holy Spirit in that moment, is that not divine and holy? But that second question, are we walking in the Spirit? And that's a question for all of us to consider because the church is just a building, but all together, us as people, the people of the church, are we walking in the Spirit? You know, I don't think we're, yeah, I know we're not supposed to chase after spiritual experience. That's not the point. I think we're supposed to constantly experience the Holy Spirit in every aspect of our walk, in every ministry, every program. And I think we're supposed to be a beautiful family that does family well. Let me end with this. The worship leader, John, Jonathan Helser, says this. He says, the more heaven comes to earth, the more earth looks like family. The more heaven comes to earth, the more earth looks like family. So let, let us be a spirit-filled family, a beautiful family who walks in the spirit, who takes care of one another, prays and worships together. And let's take communion together as a family. Get your communion elements ready. You know, and as we take communion, um, there's, there's two layers here. We have a, I have some juice. I have a cracker. That's that first layer. That's obvious. Uh, but can we look beyond to see with a depth perspective to be reminded of what Peter preached about, about Jesus and his ministry and his death and his resurrection and the Holy Spirit that was given? Let's see with that ever-deepening depth depth perspective, to see the layers beyond just juice and a cracker. And let's take this together. Let me read this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember him. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's remember him. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you're so welcomed here. Welcome to guide, to lead, to prompt, to teach, to give wisdom on our own strength. If it was our own strength, our own understanding, we can't do much besides just keep ourselves busy with programs and events. Holy Spirit, empower us Give us eyes to see the more of who you are. I pray that we would be a people who give just everything we are to see everything that you are. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I pray that we would be a people that are filled with the Spirit and that walk in the Spirit. We thank you, we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.